How's everybody? Doing good? Good. Let's pray. Hoorah. Father, we're grateful for Valley Bible Church. We're grateful for the truth of your word that you speak to us. Thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. We, we sense it. We know it intuitively. It's a truth that is undeniable. Thank you that you live in our hearts. Your spirit tells us so, and your word promises that, that we are new and we are clean and we are your children. Not certainly because of anything that we have done, not by deeds of righteousness, but by your mercy. And we plead your mercy this morning for our continued failings. Even this morning, we're imperfect. Even this morning, we need to say to you, God, please forgive me. We've said or done or not said or left undone things that make us unclean. And you've called us to be holy as you are holy, and we seek that holiness this morning to live in a world of deep darkness. May we be your light in this time. So we do pray, again, that you would speak, Lord, because your servants are listening, and we pray that you would teach us your word, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Would you turn with me to Psalm 73, the 73rd Psalm in your Bibles? I have, um, we've been in the... uh, in the book of Psalms, and um, doing this series called Lord of the Song, and I've wanted to uh, avoid repeating psalms that I have preached on before here at Valley Bible Church, because I've I've already preached on them. And um, so there are a number of psalms that I've done from time to time, and uh, Psalm 73 is a psalm that I preached nine and a half years ago. (laughs) In fact, uh, today, this first Sunday in August, is our 10th anniversary of being at Valley Bible Church. Ten years. But there are some passages of Scripture that so grab you and hold you. If, you. if I were to say I had a life verse, this would be it. And my wife Tara would agree that this is a passage of Scripture that we would say this has formed us and um, molded our thinking about God and about Christ and what we have on this earth and what we look forward to probably more than any other passage of Scripture. And um, some things happened. We learned this while we were in seminary. And uh, I was just thinking as we were standing there, I look back and think about those two young kids, and I feel so sorry for them, (laughs) Tara and I, back then, those two young kids, because we were so poor, really we were, and uh, I don't know, for for the life of me, other than the grace of God, I don't know how we made it through four years of full-time school, um, working two, three jobs at a time, it's just unbelievable, but we were dirt poor, and I remember standing in line at Kroger's grocery store one day, and we had a few meager items in our basket. And um, some of you have done this. We were counting up how much they cost to make sure that when we got up to uh, pay for them, we would have enough money. You know, we had some tortillas and we had some dry beans because we we like tortillas and beans. Actually, we ate tortillas and beans because. That's all we could afford. Now we eat them because we like them, but uh, <laughs> make our own tortillas, by the way. But anyway, we, um, counting up, had some milk and some diapers. We had a little baby boy named Benjamin. And um, kind of in my head, I knew how much was in the basket, and I knew how much was in my wallet. And a guy came to the line next to us, loud, brash, arrogant, profane, using language, you know, just uh, cussing up a storm, calling attention to himself. He had this big bas- ba- uh, cart full of beer. He was obviously intoxicated already, and he pulled this big wad of bills out of his pocket, and he starts just kind of 
in front of everybody, making this big show of all the money, what a big man he was. And I'm going, really, God? Really? Why is that? And it was at that time, and I'll share more about that, probably more next week, because it's going to take us two weeks to get through this psalm. It's too, too important, I think. Um, but God taught us some incredible lessons. So let's read the psalm. And Psalm 73, would you please stand as we read God's word, because we believe God is speaking to us now. Speak, O Lord, because we know that you are speaking to us. The word of God, Psalm 73 Please give attention to his reading. A Psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, well, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they have increased in wealth. Surely I in vain have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence, For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream, when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This psalm is, um, you may notice in your your Bibles, it says book three right above there. Remember that the collection of the psalms, the Psalter, is this collection of psalms that were put together, and they were put together in five different books. So far, we have looked at the uh, samplings of the first two books, and this morning we're going to start with the first psalm of the third book written by Asaph. Asaph was a, a Levite priest. He was a, a, a professional musician. He was like a worship pastor, a minister of, 
of, of music in the temple. That's what he did as a, his priestly function and his duties. He led people in worship in the temple courts. And um, the first 11 psalms of the third book, beginning in Psalm 73, are written by Asaph, this man. And so um, we are probably not going to get enough samplings throughout the rest of uh, the summer. Um, next week we are uh, going to finish this psalm, and then we've got some more things coming up. So we'll probably finish um, a series on psalms next, next summer, finish the rest of the uh, samplings of the three books. But Asaph was a man who obviously spent a lot of time around holy things, a lot of time in the, in the sanctuary, uh, a worship leader, and he had some questions, and we have these questions too. Have you ever asked this yourself? Do you ever wonder how some people can be radically anti-God and yet they are so happy, healthy, rich, attractive, and famous? Sure you have. How can it be? How can that be in this world that you have people that rail against God, everything holy, they believe in everything that is unholy, and they're not afraid to tell you so and live it out flagrantly, and yet they seem to get away with it. They're happy, they're healthy, they're wealthy, they're beautiful, and everybody loves them and is drawn to them. And let's face it, sometimes we're just plain envious. I mean, we look at that and we say, we look at the things that they do and the way that they live their life, and we, we say to ourselves, well, how on earth do they get away with that? And why do they get to have all the fun? Why do they get to have all the fun when God's people have to be so buttoned up and have no fun? Boring Christian life, or so it would seem. We've all thought those thoughts. I'm certain that you have. And the problem is this. The problem is simple. The problem is that God is good and wicked people prosper. Both of those things are true at once. And Asaph sees it and he, it doesn't compute. And it doesn't compute for us either. We know that God is good and yet we know that the wicked prosper. It's a, it's a common theme in the Old Testament and the Jews often ask the question, how on earth can this be that the wicked will prosper when God is good? He begins with these words. He says, surely God is good to Israel. We know that God is good to Israel. In fact, he starts with this word, surely. It's a little Hebrew adjective, and we're going to see it three times in the psalm. And it means indeed, surely, it is true, God is good to Israel. Not just good to Israel, but to those who are pure in heart. So he's not just saying God is good to all Jews, but those who are pure in heart. These are the real believers. These are the ones in Israel who have a relationship with God, not just those who are called Jews, not those who are just church members, but those who really love the Lord. God is good to them. And Asaph begins with the conclusion of what he came to at the end of, of all his, his imaginings and all that he went through, and he states his conclusion up front. He knew it was true, and he's going to show us how he reaches that conclusion, but he reaches that conclusion and he, and he speaks it up front. God is good to his people, to those who, who live a pure and holy and righteous life. One must be in a relationship with God. You must know the living God. And this is the kind of person that he's talking about. But he says in verse 2, But as for me... My feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. He came right up to this line of some precipice of this deep, dark chasm, and he almost fell and slipped headlong into some sort of oblivion. And he's going to tell the story of how he almost went over the edge. Over the edge of what? God is good. He almost came to an opposite conclusion. God is not good. 
That's a disastrous conclusion. It's not true. And when you come to that conclusion and you question the goodness of God or you say that God is not good, we are impugning the very character and nature of God. He is good. And Asaph almost fell headlong into an opposite conclusion that God is not good. Why did he almost fall into this conclusion? Because he looked around him and he looked at the world and he looked at the way the world looks and he had to question, is God really good? He almost slipped. He didn't, but he almost did. Why? Verse 3. For I was envious of the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Looks around him and he sees the arrogant and the wicked are doing fine. How does that shake out with the, with the goodness of God? These are interesting words. I want to just call your attention to a couple of them. He says, I was envious of the arrogant. The Hebrew word arrogant is the word halal. Hallelujah. It's a word for praise. Certainly it's right to praise God. Hallelujah. Praise to the Lord. That's what hallelujah means. It's a Hebrew word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Arrogant means praise. But this for the arrogant, the, the, the praise is reserved for whom? For oneself. Praising oneself. And their praise is misplaced. And rather than praising God as good, they praise themselves. That's the arrogant. As he said, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know this word too. Prosperity. Shalom. Shalom. God's people, the nation of Israel. God has promised them shalom, welfare, peace, prosperity. This is what God has promised his people and when Asaph looks and he sees that the wicked are experiencing shalom, which is reserved for God's people, something doesn't add up. Something is wrong. He doesn't understand it. So the problem is that God is good, but wicked people do indeed prosper. So why are we often envious of sinners. Let's go through and let's look at what he says and what he describes about the arrogant and the wicked sinners in the world. And we do oftentimes look at them with a wistful eye and wish that we could do what they do and have what they have and be like them. But why? I'm going to give you six reasons and the first is this. Because they seem to have everything that they could want. They seem to have everything that they could want. He says, there are no pains in their death. Why was he envious of them? He says, for because there are no pains in their death and their body is fat. No pains in their death does not mean that there was no... Uh, remember, we're talking about poetry here. But their life is relatively a life of ease... And they don't seem to suffer like others do. And what, what, uh, what Asaph probably did, you have to understand, he's not talking about all sinners here. He's not talking about all wicked people because we know that sinners suffer too. But what, what probably happened with Asaph was this. He knew some righteous, holy saints who walked with God. Maybe they had cancer. Maybe they had problems. Maybe they were poor. Maybe they had other physical infirmities. And they were suffering, and yet they were such godly people. And then he sees some arrogant sinners, and everything is fine with them. And so he's making this comparison. He goes, well, how, that's not right. Why should God's people suffer when I see these people over here? There isn't any pain in their life. All the way to death, no pain. Their body is fat. They're not emaciated like me. You're supposed to laugh. Anyway. This doesn't mean that they are overweight. Fat in this culture means prosperity, prosperous. Because if you have enough money, you have enough food. And so to be a little plump is not, uh, is not a, a sign of slothfulness. It was a sign of prosperity. And someone who was emaciated, like myself, doesn't have enough money to eat properly. So that's what he's talking about. They seem to have 
everything that they could want. Second reason is because their life seems to be completely trouble-free. Verse 5, they're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. They don't seem to have any problems. You know what I'm talking about. You see this in people that you know, maybe someone that you work with. They're not Christians. They don't claim to be. In fact, they're very clear in saying that they're not a Christian. And they, they're involved in, in all sorts of things that you would never even dream of doing. And they talk about their sexual exploits or their drinking exploits or whatever it may be. And yet their kids are perfect. And they've got a house on the lake. And they've got a boat. And they've got a fat 401k. And they don't seem to ever be sick. And they always seem to be upbeat and happy. And you're going, huh? And how am I going to share Christ with this person? Aren't you supposed to be unhappy? So I can tell you about how joyful it is to be a Christian and they outjoy your joy. Their life is trouble free in spite of the way they live their life. And we see that, all of us do. The third reason is because their life is edgy and exciting. Something that is uh, very attractive to this world. Verses 6 and 7, Therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. They wear pride like jewelry. It's ostentatious. It, it adorns their life, this arrogance and this pride. And they put on uh, this arrogance and they, they put on this they violence like a, a garment that covers them, just like clothes. So they are they are are the kind of people that are arrogant and violent and their eye bulges from fatness and the imaginations of their heart run riot. Their life is edgy and exciting. Women like bad boys. Nice guys finish last. Where would that idea ever come from? The women like bad boys and nice guys finish last by seeing it come true sometimes. Sometimes it is true. Sometimes women are drawn because of the brokenness of sin and the brokenness of attraction and the brokenness of sexuality, human sexuality in our culture and in the human heart that women are drawn to this bad boy image because it's attractive. It's honest. It's true. And that's what he's talking about. They wear arrogance like a necklace. And they attract people to themselves. Violence like a garment. Why do they get all the girls? This is the, the classic uh, picture of the anti-hero in literature. You know what a hero is and the guy with the white hat. But in most of our culture today, it's usually an anti-hero. We pull for the one who is an arrogant, violent womanizer, a lawbreaker. We want him to win in the movie. And we're set up by that all the time. Look at our culture. Billy the Kid, Bonnie and Clyde, Thelma and Louise, Oceans 11, 12, 13, 14, I don't know how many there are. Even James Bond. Silencer, boom, boom, boom. Gets the girl, he's arrogant, he's pride, he's, he's got all sorts of money. And women love him. He gets all the girls, and yet he's killed how many people in the movie? Wears violence like a garment, he's proud, he's arrogant. Gangsters, how many movies have been made about gangsters? And we romanticize these things. We make these people out to be heroes, they're anti-heroes. Pride is their necklace, the garment of violence covers them. Breaking Bad, House of Cards, Game of Thrones. All of these antiheroes, we pull for them. There's a whole culture of gangster rap around, around what it means to be a gangster in the hood. And even if you die by violence, you have more street cred than ever, right? And it's romanticized as a good thing. 
And, and young men are drawn to that because there's something broken in that kind of masculinity that they want to be drawn to. And what's even worse, that probably the greatest example of that is ISIS beheading people and having young boys shoot and be others and behead people. And yet what's happening? They're drawing young men from all over the world because pride is their necklace and violence is their garment. And there's something that draws people to that edginess. It's exciting. It's different. Their eye bulges from fatness. They see and the imaginations of their heart run riot. It means they, they, there, there isn't any end to what they can imagine and, and the evil that they can do. And it gets more and more edgy all the time. And people are drawn to that. And that's why some are envious of sinners. The fourth reason that we are often envious of sinners is because their profoundly arrogant ways draw fame and followers. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. They're so arrogant and they're always mocking Speaking from on high, which means they're always speaking down at and about others. I mean, how many comedians have made a living on, on putting other people down? And they speak from on high. And not only do they speak from on high, putting other people down and oppressing others, but then they even speak against God himself. They have set their mouth against the heavens, a figure of speech for God. They speak against God himself, and their tongue parades through the earth for everybody to see, and everybody sees Howard Stern, and he's really cool. And everybody wants to be like him and have his fame and have his fortune. Comedians make a living out of making fun of other people and making fun of God and making fun of God, him, God's people, John Stewart, Bill Maher, and it's cool and it's edgy and it's trendy and, and it draws followers and people just want to be like them and they become their disciples. You think that even Christians are not drawn to that? Verse 10 this is a really hard verse to translate and understand, and all I can do is tell you what I, what I believe it says. It says, therefore, his people, God's people, return to this place of arrogance and all this, this talking, and waters of abundance are dr drunk by them. It means they can't get their fill. They drink in the words of these people, and they just drink it in, and they become like them. They follow them. They are... those who become just like the ones that they, that they have envy for. This people are God's people, and they are tripped up, and they follow the arrogance of those that they would uh, ostensibly say that they don't believe in. Happens all the time. Um, I've told you stories like this before, but I met a young Marine this Last week, the week before last, a young girl getting out of the Marine Corps, and we were talking. And she was getting out because she had uh, ruined her knees, and so getting a medical discharge. She didn't want to get out, but it was, well, she was disappointed in that. She was also going through a divorce. She couldn't have been more than 20, maybe 21 at the most going through divorce. She was sad and she was down, and I said, well, where is God in all this for you? Because she told me she was raised in Arkansas, and I said, you were probably raised a Baptist, right? She said, yeah, I was. She said, well, you know, I'm not really religious anymore. I don't believe in organized religion, and I still kind of believe in God, but I don't really, you know, go in for that too much. How did that happen? to this young girl that was raised in a church, taught better, she knew what was right and was wrong, 
oftentimes we hear that we're not preparing our young people. I think what, what really happens is they probably know enough. It's when they get away, they, they don't continue with what they know because they don't fellowship and they don't, they don't affiliate with other believers. And so the people that, that, that they look to are the ones who drink the most beer. The ones who really impress them are the ones who have the most sex. The ones that they really want to be drawn to are the ones who, who use the F word for everything in the, under the sun because they're, they're, they've thrown off all the restraints and they're envious of sinners and they want to be like them and they want to be accepted and so they drink in these waters of abundance and they're filled with it and they're drawn to it. Happens all the time. These profoundly arrogant ways draw fame. And when someone is is famous, they draw followers. These are the Biebers, the Miley Cyruses of the world who just live a life of of, um, abandon. And young people look to them as, this is what I want to be like. This is what real happiness is. The fifth reason that we are often envious of sinners is because they seem to get away with sin. They seem to get away with sin. They say, well, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? I'm not into organized religion anymore. I'm not that religious of a person. How does God know? Well, where is he? Is there knowledge with the Most High when, it, when, when he says this? I think this is sarcasm. If, if God is so high and mighty, why doesn't he strike me dead? And people even say that today. They, they rail against God himself. Where is your God? Why doesn't he strike me dead if I'm doing so many wrong things? And Asaph is wondering the same thing. I remember once when our kids were we were in the throes of parenting and our boys were doing something. I don't know what it was. Maybe they were trying to kill each other, but they were fighting. And I had one of those uh, paternal parent moments where I just kind of froze and Tara looked at me and she goes, Ben, aren't you going to do something? And that's what, what it's like with, with us. And we look at the world and we say, God, aren't you going to do something? Are you going to let this be? Are you going to let this stand? How can you allow this to happen? They seem to be getting away with sin. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They have increased in wealth. That's kind of the summary statement. There they are, folks. Here you have it. The wicked, always at ease, plenty of money, happy, all the sex they want, all the girls, all the men, all the fame, all the fortune, whatever they want, they've got it. That's it. They seem to be getting away with sin, but the sixth reason that we are envious of sinners is because we don't get away with anything. We don't get away with it. He says in verse 13, Surely... In vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. He began the psalm by saying, surely God is good. And now he he gets into this questioning mode and he says, surely I have kept my way innocent in vain. The first conclusion was a right conclusion. This conclusion is a wrong conclusion because he has compared himself with the wrong people. He's gotten distracted, and he's come to an erroneous conclusion. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He began the psalm, but he says, now surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. Why? Because every time I turn around, God seems to be whacking me. Stop it, son. Don't do that. Do that. Sit up straight. You shouldn't be that way. Don't act that way. Discipline for my sin all the time, he says. And they're getting away with it, and I don't get away with the thing. So, 
we are often envious of sinners because we see that they are, they seem to be happy and healthy and rich and famous and all these wonderful things and they seem to be getting away with it and we get away with nothing. But if that were the end of the story, this would be horrible, wouldn't it? But it's not. So we know why we are sometimes envious of sinners, but why should we not be envious of sinners? In verses 15 through 20, Number one, there are just two reasons. Number one, because we might cause others to stumble. It's one reason. He said, if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He, he's, here's Asaph. I'm a professional musician. I'm a, a worship pastor. If he had gone into the, the, the place of worship and he said, okay, everybody stand up. We're going to sing Psalm 100. I'm going to lead you in this psalm. Before I do, y'all need to recognize something. You know me. I'm a righteous guy. I'm a Levite. I'm a priest. I'm a worship leader. But have you seen what's happening in the streets of Jerusalem? The prostitution? The immorality, the greed, the gluttony, the arrogance. Folks, they're getting away with it. And here you are presenting sin offerings every day. The people will be going, he's got a point. And he recognizes if I, have give, if I give voice to this with God's people, I'm going to cause others to stumble. And he catches himself. He realizes that this is wrong. He realizes that I, I can't do this. I can't give voice to this this, this pondering, this, this, this conundrum that, I, that I'm struggling with, it is, it's wrong. I just can't say anything about it because we have a responsibility to others. There are some things that are left unsaid better. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome on my side. He was thinking through this whole thing and it was just, ah, I can't understand it. It is way beyond me. So the first reason is we might cause others to stumble, so we should not be envious of sinners. The second reason is because sinners are not getting away with anything. They seem to, but not. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, he said, then I perceived their end. Asaph came into the sanctuary. The sanctuary was the place of God's presence. And he had some kind of revelation. He had some kind of oracle. God spoke to him. In a moment, he seems to have seen the end of the wicked. He seems to have seen it in one glimpse of just this this panoramic view of the destruction and judgment of those who are, are arrogant and violent and have all this money and happy and healthy and beautiful and famous. And in one moment, they're gone. And he sees it with his mind's eye in some revelation from God. He says, surely, this is the third time he uses that little adverb, surely, the first was a right conclusion, surely God is good to Israel. The second one was a wrong conclusion, surely I've kept my heart pure in vain. What's the point of being a Christian? Wrong conclusion, final conclusion, surely you have set them in slippery places. They are on the precipice and they go into the void. They fall headlong into that place of destruction. You cast them down to to destruction, how they are destroyed in a moment, utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. It's a poetic way of, of saying that they just vanish. You know what it's like when you wake up in the morning, you've had this, this dream, you just wake up, and there were some people in the dream and some things, and you start to think, now what was, who was that, and what happened? No, nah, never mind. And you just go on with the day. That's what he's talking about. That's how the wicked will, will be dealt with. It's like a dream, a phantom, and eh, gone. Gone in a moment. They do not get away with anything. So here is the thing. Next week, we're going to look at the rest of this psalm, but listen. Those who reject God will be rejected by him quickly, completely, forever. That's a horrible truth, folks, but it is a truth. 
that should cause us to pray for these people and not rail against them, not want to be like them and not rail against them, but to pray for them for their salvation. Pray for the salvation of Howard Stern, Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus, whoever it may be, the Kardashians, all these people that everyone looks up to, but they are going to be swept away in a moment. We should pity them. This is nothing to envy. It's nothing to envy being swept away forever completely and judged forever. That is nothing that we should ever want for anyone or think that we should want for ourselves because all that the world offers is hollow, it's vain, and it's temporary. It's going away. Hollow, vain, empty, temporary. Now we have to be honest that what the world offers is attractive. We have to be honest with that. Sin is pleasurable. It is. You tell your kids it's not, you're lying to them. That's what's so dangerous about it. It is pleasurable. But, Hebrews 12, speaking of Moses, it says this, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. There is a pleasure to sin, but it is passing It is hollow, it will not satisfy, it will not last. And he was considered, even Moses, before he knew of the Messiah, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. And that's what the message of this psalm is, and we'll finish it out next week. But Christ and being identified with him is our greatest treasure. There isn't anything in this world that, has the, that, that can offer you, that can fill you, that can fulfill you, that can make you happy. Christ is it. Christ is the thing. Christ is the one. But you have to know him. You have to know him by faith. Trust that he died to, to pay for all those sins that the world looks at as wonderful, but will cause them to be swept away. And he sweeps away those sins that by faith we will stand on solid ground and we will never fall into that precipice or over the precipice, into the void. We will never be utterly swept away by judgment because he has taken that judgment for us. Amen? So there is nothing for us to be envious of in this world. It's all going away. The last line of this This psalm says, that I may tell of your works. We are saved and we enjoy the riches of Christ to tell others about it, to tell those who are perishing that they too can have a treasure that is beyond this world. And that's our responsibility to do. Now we're going to have communion at this time. And as the elements are passed, um, I encourage you to, th- to think about this psalm, to think about maybe the areas that you have been tripped up in. Maybe you have almost slipped yourselves. Where have you been envious and fallen prey to materialism or greed or lusts of the flesh, whether it's food or alcohol or drugs or, or sex or whatever it may be? Have you fallen prey to pride and arrogance and violence? Even if they're violent thoughts toward others, this is the time to let them go and remember that they're only passing pleasures of sin, but he is the greatest treasure to know him. And you, you hold a picture of it in your hands this morning, his blood shed for you, his body broken, that you can be free. Judgment that you are set free. Father, we thank you for this bread and this cup which represents the broken body that he really inhabited, that God came to earth and lived as a man. And we thank you for this cup, which represents a life poured out, a life of sacrifice, 
blood shed to pay for sins, your wrath satisfied for all time. We pray that you would cleanse us this morning from being too familiar with the world. God, help us to be like Jesus, to find our all and all in him. And to tell others, may we be motivated this morning by the end of sinners to tell them the good news. Whether we reject it or not, Lord, we pray that we would. Restore us to the joy of salvation and to fellowship with this cup and this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Please hold the bread and the cup until everyone is served, and we will partake together as a church family. Save you. 